Okay, so hello and welcome back. So we have just seen some of the things which can happen when multicollinearity is present in a problem. And in the example I did, that was very obvious. We had just two columns of data and they basically looked the same. So if you had a quick look at the data, you would immediately see something is funny there. But if there are more inputs and it's collinearity between more than two columns, then that is much less obvious. And in this section, we will discuss how to detect that multicollinearity is, is present even if it's not immediately obvious from the data. So let's see what we can do. So we are interested how we can detect that multicollinearity is present. There are various informal ways to do that. For example, if you look at this picture from the previous video, here the characteristic effect was that the uncertainty ellipse is very elongated. And if you look what happens when we project this down onto individual ranges. So here we would think probably the confidence interval for beta 1 will come out something like this. And the confidence interval for beta 2 will come out as something like this. And both confidence intervals contain the point zero. So if we do hypothesis tests, both of these coefficients will not be significantly different from zero. But if we look at the joint picture, then we see here this ellipse is far away from zero, there is a large gap. So the f-test, which tests can all coefficients be zero simultaneously, that will reject this hypothesis. And that is one of the informal indicators which can tell you something suspicious is going on. So if each coefficient is not significantly different from zero individually, but the coefficients simultaneously are, that is a point where you should at least investigate further. Now, what I want to do here is I want to discuss a more formal criterion, and that's the condition number. So the condition number of a matrix, I call it X, because we will use it for the design matrix, is defined in one of two ways. It's either defined as the largest eigenvalue of X transpose X divided by the smallest eigenvalue, or the square roots of these eigenvalues are called singular values of the matrix. So you can also write sigma max, the largest singular value of x, divided by the smallest singular value of x. And there is a very easy rule of thumb, namely if that's smaller than 10, we are okay. If we are bigger than 30, then we have severe problems. And anywhere in between, we have mild problems. And the reason that that criterion works is that we know a matrix is invertible if all of its eigenvalues are different from zero. And here X transpose X is positive definite. So we know the eigenvalues are greater or equal to zero, positive semi-definite it is actually. And so the only case it goes wrong is if the smallest eigenvalue equals zero, in which case we would get infinity, that's when it's not invertible. And if that eigenvalue is small, then it's close to being not invertible, and then the ratio gets large, and we at some point hit this rule of thumb cutoff of 30. So that's a concept from numerical linear algebra, I would say, and that's what we can use here. And we can do that easily in R. There is a function called kappa, named after the Greek letter kappa, which is a symbol for the condition number. And you have two choices. You can either write straight out kappa of x, or if you have already fitted the linear model, then you can also write kappa of m, and it will give you the same result. There is one small subtlety, namely by default that uses some approximate method and to get the actual condition number you need to write exact equal true here and here. And apparently the exact method is slower than the approximate method it uses without that option. But I have never run into trouble where that took too long, so I would recommend just using it like I just wrote with exact equals true. Good, so that is how we can do that. And I want to show you a slightly more theoretical value. Namely, there is a tool called singular value decomposition. And we have seen that before, that allows to write a matrix as U, D, V transpose. 
where you and we are either orthogonal or have at least orthogonal columns. The difference being they may not be square depending on which version of singular value decomposition you look at. And the one which is built into R that will give you what is called the reduced SVD where the dimensions are so x is n times p plus 1 and p plus 1 is the smaller of the two and then r would do the reduced version which gives you an n times p plus 1 matrix here a p plus 1 times p plus 1 matrix for d and another p plus 1 times p plus 1 matrix for v and so v is an orthogonal matrix and u is a rectangular matrix with orthogonal columns good and d is diagonal and the diagonal elements are the singular values. So you can find the singular values by looking at the diagonal of the matrix D. And in the R function, you get the diagonal element in descending order. So the first one will be the largest and the last one will be the smallest. And that goes very well with this. Namely, then the condition number is the first diagonal element divided by the last one. Good. And this I just mentioned because it has an additional advantage, namely the columns of the matrix V, they have some significance and well, let's first do an experiment. X transpose X, if I plug that in, is for X transpose, I need to transpose the whole thing. So it's U, D, V transpose, transpose, then U, D, V transpose. And we spoke about taking the transpose of a product, the term swap order. So we have V, D, U transpose, U, D, V transpose. And I didn't bother transposing the D because it's diagonal. Nothing changes if I take the transpose. Good. Now in the middle, we have U transpose U, which will have shapes like this. So U has more rows than column. So it looks like an upright rectangle and you transpose consequently has fewer rows than columns so it looks like a sideways rectangle and I said the columns of you are orthogonal so if I take the inner product of one here and one here I get zero unless I took the same column and then I get one because I should have maybe written ortho normal columns here that's how they do it the columns are normalized to length one and they are orthogonal and what we get then is this turns into the identity matrix. It is rectangular matrix. And if I multiply the same column to itself, then I get a one. And for all, for all the others, I get zero. So that's an identity matrix, a small one, P plus one times P plus one. So that's V D squared V transpose. Good. And now we need a similar argument. Namely, what I want to show you is that if V is a column of V, then X V Euclidean length squared is, we know that, V transpose X transpose X V. That's how the Euclidean norm is defined. And using what I've just done, we get V transpose capital V D squared capital V transpose little V. So we need to understand what happens if we have, say, V multiplied from the left with the column of V. So let's say V1, the first column. Well, what we get is we multiply this row with the first column. They are also normal. So I get a 1. Then we multiply this row with the second column. They are orthogonal. I get a 0. And that goes on until we multiply that row with the last column, they are still orthogonal, so I still get a zero. And similarly, if I multiply any other column, not the first one, then I get a vector which is all zeros, except in the position corresponding to the column, I get a one. So this expression here is actually rather simple because this one here is a vector which has only one entry, which is one. Let's just call it E1 and then say VK, the case column times V is EK, that's the standard basis vectors. And then here we get VK, let's put an index in here. Then we get EK and that's actually EK transpose, it's a row vector, D squared EK. 
And that is rho k column k of d squared, so that is sigma k squared. And all of this argument just shows the length of x v k is sigma k of x. Good, and that tells us something because if we think back to the start of the video, if we find a vector v such that x v is small, close to zero, then we have identified multicollinearity, and here we have x v has length sigma k. So if sigma k approximately zero, we have multicollinearity. And we can bring that one step further, namely if we look at the vector v, that actually tells us which columns of x are linearly dependent. So these vk come from the SVD. If we compute the SVD in R, we get the vectors vk. And we can look at them, and if hypothetically one of them would look, I don't know, minus 1, 1, 0, 0, 0, then it would tell us minus 1 times x1 plus 1 times x2 is approximately 0, if the corresponding zinc level value is small. And similarly, if that comes out as, I don't know, 1, 1, 1, 0, 0, minus 2, 0, then we would just need to count, and presumably if there's an intercept, we should probably start numbering the columns at 0, so 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. But if it came out like this, we would know the intercept x1, x2, and x5 are linearly dependent in the way that 1 plus x1 plus x2 minus 2 x5 is approximately equal to 0. So the Sinclair values tell you if you have a problem, and if one is small, you have one group of linearly dependent vectors, and if several are small, then you know there are several groups, and the vk, they are called right singular vectors in this context, you can look at them and see exactly which components have the problem. And of course, that will not numerically come out like this, but it may come out as 0, 0, 0, 1 and 0, 0, 2 and small numbers and larger numbers, so you need to round them and look at them a bit. But you can identify columns involved in the problem using this way. Good, so that finishes our discussion on how to detect multicollinearity. And in the notes, you can find one more section about what to do if you have problems with multicollinearity. But that, that, that section is very short, and I'm not going to make a separate video for that. Just go to the note and have a look yourself. Okay, so thank you, and bye-bye, and see you again in the next video in a few days' time.